Hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I hope you're not too tired. So I have lots of pictures in my presentation, and I hope you can enjoy. Um, so as Black said, I'm a board member of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, and at the beginning of this year, I initiated um, the Map Fugees, which consists of um, OpenStreetMappers from France, uh, the UK, Germany, and also um, people from the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, and other interested people like um, missing mappers from the UK and architects, and of course the refugees themselves, because it's participatory mapping. Um, we mapped in two camps uh, in northern France. They're approximately two hours from here with the car. Uh, one is in Dunkirk um, and one is in Calais. And they're situated at the border um, to the UK. So um, what's the political situation behind that? Why, why are people coming here and why is it so difficult for um, both the governments and the NGOs um, to deal with this problem. Um, this picture pretty much sums up why the people are here. Um, they want to go to the UK. Um, this is um, the main reason why uh, they are coming there. And this has, um, they, they do this for different reasons. Either they have lived there, they do it because of the language, or they have family members living there. And the problem is that um, you cannot just enter the UK legally um, and claim asylum. So the only chance they have um, is to do it illegally um, by jumping on lorries or trying to um, sneak onto a ferry or um, in a car. And the main reasons uh, they are fleeing is really war and conflict. So um, there are people from uh, the Middle East um, Iraq, Iran, um, Afghanistan, and there are also the so-called economic migrants, which come um, to live a bit better life. Um, and there are also many ethnics that suffer from repression in their home countries. So now we come to the evolution of the maps. As Blake said, they are pretty um, young. So there's one um, camp in Dunkirk, um, it was, um, it formed itself in um, summer last year, and it was really a squalor camp, so the sanitary conditions were unacceptable, um, and MSF was um, uh, taking care of the people living in the camp, and they spent their own money to um, build a new camp, a um, new camp according to humanitarian um, standards, and the people moved in, and the spring this year, um, and um, in contrast to the camp uh, in Cali, um, the population is um, homogenic and also um, in a constant number. So um, these are Kurdish people from Iraq, Iran, um, and Syria. And 20% of them um, are families, which is a real um, characteristic of this camp because we don't have that in Cali. And there are about 3,500 uh, people living in this camp. And this is an aerial of the camp, um, which was taken, I think, during the construction. This is why there are no people there yet. Um, so you can see it's really long stretched. It's situated between railways and uh, motorways. So now we come to the camp um, in Calais. Uh, it's a bit older, <laughs> one and a half uh, years old. Um, and it suffered from um, many evictions because there are much, much more persons. So by now there are 10,000 persons um, and 1,000 unaccompanied minors. Um, uh, the French state built inside the camp a container camp, which you can, yeah, you can see it uh, on the aerial there. Um, and there are about maybe 10 nationalities in the camp. So. Um, most people are from Afghanistan, followed by Sudan, and more and more people from Ethiopia, Eritrea, and also the Oromo ethnic is there, and then Pakistan, Iraq, Kurdistan, and some Egypt also. And 98% uh, of the residents are male, um, and the camp keeps growing and growing. <laughs> it just uh, doesn't stop, so... Um, 
we can say that there are about 1,000 new people coming each month, and especially um, the number of uh, unaccompanied minors arriving in the camp is very worrying. Um, because they get younger and younger, and when I was there last week, there were about 10 minors arriving each day. Ah, okay, the camp management. So, um, th this is a bit... Uh, <laughs> the camp management is, in a way, non-existent, um, because uh, both camps are not ne neither state-run nor uh, officially run by an NGO. Um, and I would say that the camp in Dunkirk is kind of semi-organized because it was built uh, by uh, MSF. But as you can see, um, most of the services, food, NFI, um, especially education, legal counseling, uh, is done by both volunteer um, organizations um, and MSF, Red Cross, and the French government, but I must say that the bulk of the work is done by volunteer organizations and the refugees themselves. So they have, of course, um, a refugee council there, um, and they do a lot of volunteering and are also active in the warehouses, food distribution and NFI distribution. So the camp in Cali um, has no operator at all. Um, there are many, many volunteers uh, in the camp, so without the volunteer organizations, the camp would be in a very bad state. Um, it is, yeah, food um, and NFI um, derived from individual donations, which can cause real problems, because like in July, when there was a food shortage, because the donations were getting less and less. Um, the French government provides a part like I think like one third of food um, and NFI, which is done by ACTA, they're there with two people. Um, health is MSF, um, they do, um, they run a youth center there, they're there with 15 people for all the minors. Um, MDM and also the French government are there with one doctor. Um, EVI's assistance is nearly entirely done by MSF and also volunteer organizations. They cooperate, which is very rare, I think. Um, yes, yeah, same for the um, for the other services. So uh, it's it's more they, they share um, responsibilities. And in this camp, the refugee community is um, uh, very engaged in the running of the camp. So um, community leaders um, are very important persons there, and persons one should know if you want to work there. So um, there are weekly coordination meetings from um, our volunteer organizations, the NGOs, and the respective community leaders. And they also do a lot of volunteering, like in Dunkirk. Now, the infrastructure of both camps. So apparently, Dunkirk, as a destructured camp, uh, has much better conditions. Um, th there is no public electricity, but they have a huge charging station where um, refugees can charge the smartphones um, and the power banks. There's no public Wi-Fi, but many um, people get donated uh, mobile data. Um, they have street lamps. They have a functioning drainage system um, and real functioning waste management and paved, paved roads also. Where is in Cali, it's um, a bit <laughs> totally different. No electricity at all. Um, few street lamps, I think 10 street lamps. Um, of course, no Wi-Fi, and there's one tiny charging station, um, no drainage system, and of course, there's a lot of sand and mud in the camp. And the waste management consists of um, four of these containers, <laughs> which burn regularly. So, let's look at the housing. Um, uh, Dunkirk mainly consists of um, these prefabricated um, shelters uh, from MSF, the MSF, so-called MSF boxes and UNHCR tents. Um, so um, this is Kali. Um, and I'm showing these pictures and I'm speaking about the infrastructure because it influences heavily our procedure and also um, our workflow inside the camps. Um, people are sleeping rough. New arrivals are most of the time uh, sleeping rough. There are small tents, self built structures, then UNHCR tents again, the blue tents from MSF. Um, 
and MSF boxes, caravans, and then the shipping containers um, from the French government. So these are, yeah, the usual small tents. This is uh, the Sudanese hill. <laughs> um, these are self-built structures. Um, this might turn into um, a double house. I don't know <laughs> what they're planning. Um, so this is, yeah, this is like a usual path. Um, which might become a road or uh, people might move in just here. <laughs> um, and as you see, um, they really have a drainage problem there because um, it gets very muddy underneath um, the pallets. This is uh, the family caravans, where well, family are living and they are donated. And this, these are the shipping containers for 1,500 refugees. Um, it is a fenced community, so um, we were not allowed to enter it. Um, so what was the data situation? Um, Dunkirk was mapped, uh, neither on OSM, and not on Google Maps, of course. Uh, we got cut files from architects, and we also didn't have any up-to-date imagery. This um, graphic, uh, I found this in a newspaper, so this is, was practically all the information we got before we were start starting to work there. Um, in Calais there was um, pre-eviction data, an open street map, and there was a U-map, and these two maps are around in the camp, so there's one hand-drawn map and the info point. And in this, there are three um, uh, of these camp maps made by ACTED. That's basically it. Um, yeah, this is uh, the U-map, which I made, so um, but this was only in digital form. So now when we started mapping, we discovered that um, we need a kind of headquarter to really reach the people, um, because it's not like in a university setting that you say you meet at two o'clock and then the lesson goes uh, for 90 minutes. So uh, we had to find a really, really good place for outreach, which in Dunkirk was directly at the Refugee um, Welcome Center. Um, this was really central um, camp position, plus they had a roof, which was great. So we just had to buy a table um, and chairs, which um, got less and less <laughs> day by day. Um, yeah, we were promised uh, electricity two to three hours a day, which was not <laughs> always the case. Um, and we were strongly visible because all new arrivals um, went there, and whenever people needed NFI, um, they went there too. Um, and we had a really continuous presence there, and at the same time it was possible to create a learning space. Yeah, this is again our cozy corner. Um, in Calais we found three solutions. <laughs> we had our official headquarters at Jungle Box. Um, this is kind of an um, educational facility, you could say. So Jungle Box is, is, a, is a library, and there are three classrooms around it. Um, and there are many, many people um, passing by, and um, it's a bit like a court, so it's also a protected area, and also kind of stopover from the northern to uh, the southern part, and it's, uh, there are sometimes music, and just n nice to get together, and people are um, dancing or cooking food. And then we had um, temporary headquarters, um, which meant we just spent a few days in another... Um, Oh, okay, these are pictures. In another, like at Duffer School, um, we, sp we spent a few days there to reach uh, the local communities <coughs> because, of course, at Duffer School there are mostly Sudanese people. Um, and then we had the mobile mapping teams um, where we just, in a way, we just grabbed a refugee and asked if he wanted to map with us in the camp. And some said yes. <laughs> So then we just um, yeah, went, went out and um, mapped most of the time using field papers. Um, the tools we used. So this is, yeah, this sums the tools up. This is uh, the low tech approach. <laughs> the other approach was the no tech approach. Um, in Dunkirk, we were really lucky because um, due to the uh, comfortable learning situation, we could use a lot of tech. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, we were using field papers, garments, and also laptops, and um, but we didn't map on smartphones, we only taught them how to use um, MapsMe, 
and then now it's, it's the usual field paper and stuff. Uh, you just go around and then <coughs> the data you gather it on the field papers and put it uh, up on the laptop, edit it in Jotham and um, upload it. So um, it was very different in Cali, um, also because there were no field papers possible. So uh, we drew a lot, so we had a lot of joints and uh, we worked a lot with colors, markers, but we started uh, to uh, map with apps. Yeah, this is uh, what a usual um, workplace looks like at the Jungle Books library. And whenever we could, we tried to use laptops, but it was very difficult to find a really quiet place where it was possible to, um, to explain to people what's, uh, what can be done with Jotham. <coughs> um, participation and procedure in these two projects are um, go hand in hand. Um, in Dunkirk, we really had a complete workflow. This was very satisfying. We had a learning curve, and um, it was really possible for the refugees to um, to be able to um, <coughs> identify and, um, problems and also to find solutions for them. And they just learned, and they also reactivated their skills because many of them had previously worked uh, with computers, but had done so since a few years, since um, they started their journeys. So in the beginning it was a lot of walking, um, catching traces, uh, collecting waypoints, um, and then again field papers, and then um, from the field papers editing an OSM, edge OSM, and um, looking at the GPS traces. And in the end um, they saw it on OpenStreetMap. So um, this is really complete workflow from, from drawing, from uh, gathering data from the field, over editing and uh, mapping software and uploading it and making it to open data. Um, in Cali it was very difficult to uh, find a good way to um, motivate people to participate uh, in mapping because uh, people just didn't return so they turned up one day and the other day they were just gone and maybe came back one week later. It was a high fluctuation. Um, so what, what really worked when the mapping really started off is um, when we allowed them to do their own creations. For example, drawings. So um, this guy sat on Surya's hill and just uh, drew the whole area below him, which looked like that in the end. I think this is pretty cool. <laughs> and um, one guy, a uh, miner who lived in the container camp where we weren't just allowed to enter, was very kind and drew the camp for us inside. So, including the barking place. <laughs> um, yeah, and this, another very talented member um, from Ethiopia, Idris, he's 16 years old. He developed a color code um, and was really very accurate with this, as you, can, as you can see here. This is all in Arabic, but yeah, I think you can guess what, what it all means. So I think yellow are the restaurants, um, and green, dark green are masks. And then we invented a kind of mapping game. So um, the map wasn't complete. So we were just asking people, do you know where the Darfur school is? Um, and then we were just sticking there. And um, another way, to find out more about the structure of the camp and which paths and roads are actually used is really to ask people, so you live here, how do, how, how do you get to Jungle Books? And so for example, like here we could see, so people actually use this road to go like this because if you're walking around in the camp, it's not easy to detect what is used at the path, what's a shortcut. Um, Yes, and then they were very helpful with the translations, either directly on paper um, or they um, type them in, in um, our smartphones most of the time. So um, in the end, the um, map was translated in uh, six languages, all camp languages. Um, and this is kind of public mapping we came up with to, um, yeah, to, to have a wider outreach. So we just kept pinning our map everywhere. Um, like in Jagala Radio, at all the classrooms, just to motivate people to play with it, to scribble on it, um, or to, I don't know, throw it away maybe. <laughs> and we even attached it at the church, um, which was really good because 
people actually did the translations in Amharic. So, what are the important points on a map um, for these refugees? So, um, it was for sure social spaces and everywhere you can get food and not food items. Um, yeah, like the free, so-called free shops where you can, um, where you get a ticket and a few hours later you can get your food. That was in Dunkirk and the famous snack shack, which really provides good food. Um, and the welcome center was also a very important um, PUI. Uh, in Cali there are much more structures and much more um, really various uh, facilities. So. Um, there were, of course, um, the restaurants, which not only function as restaurants, um, but are also um, they also house new arrivals when they arrive during the night. And you don't necessarily have to pay for the food if you don't have money. Then there are the communal kitchens um, or tea tents. This one is um, the ashram kitchen. Um, this is the refugee infobus where you can get um, free Wi-Fi. And I have to say again that I'm showing all these pictures, not because you see these pictures, but because it's, you have to be in the camp and you have to talk to the residents to know what this all is about. So if you don't go with them together through the camp, you will never know that, for example, the Welcome Restaurants houses new arrivals. Oh, this van is really crucial in the camp also because all new arrivals that uh, come during the night go there um, and they get a blanket at hopefully a tent um, also. And it's, it's of course it's very, very small, um, but it's very important too. <laughs> and the schools are also um, social spaces um, that are vital for the camp. The church we have here, St. Michael's Church, it's a Coptic church. And the mosque, which, which again is not easy to detect as a mosque. I mean, it says mosque there, somebody sprayed it there, um, but you've just walked across it, uh, you wouldn't guess it's a mosque. And the football fields, and so there are many um, sportsmen in the camp, they play cricket, volleyball, and football, and they're really good and they constantly beat the volunteers. Um, and the embankment um, is also a point of interest, or more an area of interest because uh, the Wi-Fi connection is very good. Um, so very often you see the residents sitting on this embankment, which looks a bit odd if you don't know why they sit there, but it's just because they watch from their family or check Facebook. So the main challenges in this camp <coughs> is, well, yeah, the police raids, uh, the presence of police there, the police violence also for everybody who does not know what this is on the picture these are tear gas canisters that are fired in the camp regularly i didn't find a picture of the rubber bullets um, and then there are spontaneous fights in both camps and i don't know if this is uh, a proper term spontaneous fights but i'm calling it like this because uh, you cannot foresee that there's a fight breaking out so it's just, they just start fighting each other and beating each other just right beside you. And there's, a, of course, a strong uh, presence of mafia and gangs in the camp too. Um, so these are all things you have to be aware of. It sounds a bit scary now. Um, so, and, and it can be scary because, um, and I think that not everybody can do it. So when it comes to the mappers, you really need to be resilient, very resilient, very self-conscious and aware of what's going on around you. And you need a good help. And for female members, as I said, there are 98% men in this camp. Uh, it's, a, it's a special challenge um, to walk around. A few minutes. Oh, I'm just getting to the end. <laughs> okay, now the outcome is in, uh, in Denver. Well, yeah, the public maps uh, were printed. Um, and um, we had a uh, maps for handout and we also had a surroundings map for the refugees to uh, get better orientation. So this is, uh, and then we had a bus guide also. This was the outcome in the end. Um, and also for both projects, uh, the data got an awesome. Um, for the camp in Cali, uh, we have this, uh, the jungle map, 
with all the translations and the jungle map for miners, which um, was requested by MSF, and they highlighted all the safe spaces for miners.